Thank you for visiting Harvest Anglican Church. We're so glad that you're here. We hope that you're blessed by this message, and we hope that you can join us next time we gather. So be sure to look at our website, harvestsc.org, and find the next worship event and join us. God bless you. Our first reading today comes from Psalm 1. It's a responsive reading, and so your responses will be highlighted in your bulletin on page three by the, the orange bold text. Let's say it together. Happy are they who trust, and who trust in the Lord. Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of the sinners, nor sat in the seats of the scornful. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on God's teaching day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither, everything they do shall prosper. Happy, Happy are they who trust, trust in the Lord. Who trust in the Lord. It is not so with the wicked. They are like the shaft which the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall be destroyed. Happy, Happy are they who trust, who trust in the Lord. Anybody ever seen a movie Castaway with Tom Hanks? Anybody not seen that movie? <laughs> that should probably be a better question. It's a grueling three hour extravaganza of misery, is it not? He's a FedEx worker. I won't go into the plot because probably everybody knows it, but he crashes in the middle of the ocean and he washes up on a tropical beach and spends the next few years talking to a volleyball named Wilson. So, I won't go through again. I don't want you to leave the sanctuary more depressed than maybe you came in, so I won't go through the plot. But at the end of the movie, I'm sorry, but this is just the image that came to my mind when I was thinking about, you know, which way, you know, the way of God or the way of man. I was thinking about Tom Hanks' character at the end of the movie. He's standing literally at a four-way stop in the middle of nowhere. You remember that scene? And again, I'm not so great at linking stories with biblical points, but that's just what the image that came to mind because I think that all of us, every single day of our lives, whether we realize it or not, have a crossroads moment. Little crossroads moments and sometimes big crossroad moments where we have to decide which way we're going to go. Whether we're going to go God's way, by faith, by His grace at work within us, and by obedience to the Lord and His Word, or if we're going to choose to go our own way. These decisions are, are every day. I was literally talking about this the other week with our men's group. Some of you are here tonight. And let me tell you, the, the text that we read, all three of them tell us pretty bluntly that every decision matters. Every decision, every little crossroad, every big crossroad matters. It has an impact. Okay? We literally make hundreds of decisions every single day about which way we're going to go. God's way or our own way. If you really think about it. No matter how old you are, you can be young, you can be nine years old, you can be 99 years old. And, and we were talking about this a few weeks ago. It takes courage and God's grace to continue to go God's way, doesn't it? Instead of our own way. But sadly, generally speaking, and even in the church, what we find and see is that so much of today's culture, so much of today's people and world continue to live out that old Burger King slogan, have it your way. And I just remember that because I used to love Whoppers. You know, have it your way. That's, that's, what the, that's just the way the world is. In fact, it's been that way ever since Genesis chapter 3, which illustrates the fall of man. It talks about Adam and Eve, the first who decided that, that, that having God and all the blessings of his presence wasn't good enough. And so they listened to the, the tempter, they listened to the serpent, and they decided to go their own way and to be their own gods. And we make lousy little G gods, don't we? I mean, have we seen that all throughout the centuries and through all throughout human history? 
that kind of have it your way mentality has ruled the roost, hasn't it? Today's world of extreme narcissism means me centered, me, me, myself, and I has been magnified, has it not, by social media, by the TikTok videos, by the Instagram post. And I mean, I, one of my favorite new commercials is that uh, Mayhem from Allstate when he's dancing on the side of the wall. He's like, this is going to get tens and tens of views. And the guy crashes into the back of the pickup truck. Have y'all not seen that? But it's just. Me, me, me. All I see is me, me, me today. And so I would argue that we live right now in the most narcissistic culture in human history. Did you make that argument? Sure. I mean, gosh, we were at the Grand Canyon four, five, six years ago. I don't remember now. And I remember going up on this this really cool tram thing, and the guy says, by the way, we had 15 people die this year because of taking selfies. Like, talk about just me-centered, right? Like, goodness gracious, what's going on? I mean, heck, even AT&T, their latest cell phone plan is called the Unlimited Your Way plan. I mean, what kind of disasters could come from that kind of thinking, Right? And so we as Christians, as we continue to think about this sermon series of proclamation, we need to decide, are we going to make a commitment to choose to surrender to God's way, to God's grace in our life, to go his way and to delight in him? Because I think that's where it all begins. That's where our obedience really begins is our delight in him. And our delight in him becomes our proclamation when we start that journey in our life. And what I mean is that, is that by God's grace and grace alone, we begin to center our thoughts, or our entire lives, right? Our thoughts, our words, especially our deeds and our decisions. All of it is encompassing, okay? So that we begin to witness and to proclaim to ourselves and to our people around us to the watching world who doesn't know Jesus, that he is the way, that he is the way, okay? that we aren't king, we aren't rulers of our own little universes because he is, amen, Jesus is, Lord help us, Lord help us, we need that kind of surrender in our lives and we need God's grace to walk that way, amen. To walk God's road because of Genesis 3, where it's a fallen world. It's tough. Because our natural bent from that moment is to go our own way. You know, we sang about it in the first opening hymn, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it, right? Prone to leave the God I love. So here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. What a great prayer. What a great proclamation, humble proclamation, because oh, how our hearts wander. Our psalm reading and our Old Testament reading from Jeremiah could not have been more clear about that actually. Jeremiah 17 verse nine says, the heart is deceitful above all things. Wow. And Jesus actually talks about that a lot. He says all things like, I mean, wickedness and immorality, all these things spring up from the heart. So I think, church, that we need to decide today that we need to kind of get rid of that slogan that says, hey, just follow your heart. <laughs> What's your heart tell you? It's probably not the best advice based on Jeremiah and Jesus, right? We need so much grace to change this thing inside us. Because our ways, our hearts are bent to go our own way. And our readings today warn us of the repercussions of that. And in fact, uh, my Bible at home, the gospel says, it has a, a title on it, Blessings and Woes. You know? Or Blessings and Judgment. I mean, that's, that's just kind of where we sit with this. So it's very important. The verse, again, that Jeremiah in 17 says, in verse 5 and 6, he talks about the heart 
Again, in about going our own way. He says, thus says the Lord, cursed is the man. And when I say man, I mean man and woman, mankind, okay? Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. There's again that Genesis 3 thing. He's like a shrub in the desert, he says, and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Can it get any more desperate than that? I mean, really going back to Genesis 3 again, God says, hey, I've given you everything. Don't eat of that though. Don't go your own way because you know what? If you eat of that, you're going to die. And see, this is what it, this is the, the result of it. We end up being a parched land, a, a dry wilderness on our own. And yet so many of us want to put our own trust in our own selves. We want, we, we think that we can save us. But we can't. And so many of us want to put our trust in a, in a political party or a political leader or some kind of system to, to take care of all our needs and to save us. And we can't. They can't. Ultimately, without the saving grace of Jesus Christ, we will all end up being stuck in the wilderness. Okay? Lost in our own way. This idea... The Apostle Paul talks about pretty vividly in Romans chapter 7, that dry, barren wasteland type of feeling. He says, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? Who will rescue me from this barren, dry wasteland? He goes on to say, well, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what I want us to hear today, y'all. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. In him there is no condemnation. In other words, in him, we have life. We're not a dry, barren wasteland. We have life in his name. Jesus not only saves us by grace, but he also leads us in God's way by grace to make the right decisions, to go the right path, the journey of God. So I pray today that we experience through our daily choices of receiving God's grace to go his way, okay? The joy of going the way of the righteous that he talks about in Psalm 1. But with Jesus now, I pray that we experience that joy. You know, God is not some cosmic killjoy. Look what it says in in Psalm 1. Happy. You know, some translations say, blessed are those. Our delight is in him. And so happy are those whose delight is in him. Happy are those because we meditate on him day and night. And it's then that we become like strong trees that are planted beside streams of water, yielding fruit in every season. You know, we're not dried up shrubs. We're yielding fruit, meaning our gifts, our, our everything is yielding positive fruit for the Lord. And how much more so now that we have Christ? How much more so are we planted beside gushing streams of water? You know, I love that verse in in John 4. He says, he's living water within us, gushing to eternal life. Christ is the very fulfillment of Psalm 1. You ever notice that? And this is huge. Because again, going to that fruit, doesn't matter what kind of season that you're in. Maybe you're... Maybe you're old, maybe you're young, maybe you're healthy, maybe you're sick, maybe you're happy, maybe you're sad, maybe you're you know, wealthy, maybe you're poor. It doesn't matter, you know, because in every season, we're going to bear fruit with him in and through Christ. And our leaves won't wither, meaning that our lives won't dry up. That's good stuff because he is with us. He is with us. You know, I love what it says in Romans 8. It says we're more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. We don't just kind of make it to heaven by the skin of our teeth. <laughs> Here, the, the, the New Living Translation says that we have overwhelming victory through him who loves us. And, and because of that overwhelming, never-ending love and grace of God, we can proclaim that whenever even we screw up, right, Christ is in us so that everything that we do in the end prospers in God's eyes. Okay? Because we are on the way of righteousness when we decide to follow Jesus. When we decide to follow Jesus. So in closing, I'd like to ask, if you found in your life 
like me, that you've made some bad choices. You've gone your way, your own way, so badly even, that you feel like God can't love you. Maybe your choices have caused incredible damage to not only yourself, or to, but to people around you, to your community even. Well, join the club. We're a hospital for sinners here. And let me tell you, God still loves you. He will always love you. And he stands here today with open arms. So I want you to hear the good news. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even though when we went our own way, Christ died for us. Not only could Jesus, by faith in his shed blood and death on the Christ, not only can he wipe the slate of your life completely clean, your past, your present, and your future sins forever, but he can also now set you on the right path and be with you from this day forward. He will lead you by his spirit. He will lead you and guide you by his mercy and grace and by his word. That's his promise. And listen, even when we slip up and fall short, he'll be there to pick us up again and again and again and again. How great is the love of God, church? There's a reason why I believe Psalm 1 comes first in the, in the Psalm book, you know, because Jesus is the perfect embodiment of it because he is the only one who's truly righteous, amen? Only he perfectly embodies the law's demands and that's the good news of the gospel too, is that Jesus took our place and makes our way righteous. He became sin who knew no sin so that we might become his righteousness, right? He makes a way for us. And we, even when we went our own way, in this fullness of time, God sent his son into the world to save us. So he is our strength every day from this day forward. Which way are we gonna go? He is our strength. He is our grace to help us go God's way, to walk God's way of righteousness. And he is trustworthy to see it to completion in the day of our Lord. And so my closing prayer for all of us is that we would all today see the beauty and the majesty of Jesus. I pray that we take a moment and just ponder him, the love that he has for you, his desire to lead you in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, his, his desire to take you beside still waters and green pastures, his desire to see you bear fruit in your life, his desire for you to know his strength, and that your lives won't wither up and dry. I pray, Lord, that uh, you would teach us your paths, that you would help us in the way, help us to delight in you more and to proclaim that we want to know you. Guide us in your truth and teach us for you are our Savior, Lord. Make us and mold us, shape us, Lord, Help us to surrender every single day to ourselves and walk in your ways, to make the right choices just because of Jesus and who he is and all he's done, Lord, to, to take captive every thought that comes to mind in obedience to him. And Lord, may our faithful and joyful proclamations shout to the world that you are the Lord, that you are our king, and that we delight in your will and we walk in your way. For the glory of your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.